Welcome to the Morning Prep Podcast. We've got a minute because the kids haven't started to line up yet. I'm your host, Nathan Van. Now, I just wanted to start this episode by letting you all know that I do have a Facebook page for this show. On the page, I post announcements for episodes, articles that relate to the topics that are discussed, and questions about your experiences as well. So please make sure that by the time this episode ends, you head over to the Facebook page. It is facebook.com slash morningpreppod to like and follow the page. Now, let's get into the intro question. What is the secret to working with students with trauma? The hard answer is that there is no singular trick that works every single time. The reason behind that is incredibly simple, yet unknowingly complex. So before we dive into that complexities, let's just take a moment to hear a little pitch from our sponsor. So thank you for taking a moment just to listen to this little sponsored pitch. Uh, What we're going to be focused on for this little ad is something that you may not have heard of, which is Anchor.fm. Now, truth be told, have you had that killer idea for a podcast? Then Anchor.fm is your way to go. So what makes Anchor so good? is the fact that it, first and foremost, it is free. That's actually what attracted me to it in the first place, was the fact that it was a zero financial investment. But the second piece is that there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. So if you don't want to fiddle with any sort of like GarageBand or Traction or Waveform or or any other recording program like that, I only named the ones that I knew off the top of my head, then you can do it right through the computer, right through your browser. Also, what Anchor likes to do is distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many, many more. What also makes it phenomenal is the fact that you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. All right? No minimum. So you can start making money immediately. Now, the thing is, is that it is everything that you need to make a podcast in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm and get started. So this week's drink is the Nutcracker Blend from Celestial Seasonings. Now, this is a specific holiday blend that typically is released in stores just during the Christmas time season. However, my wife and I, we like to order it all year round because it is such a fantastic tea with like notes of vanilla and almost like an almond nuttiness. It is quite delicious, both on its own or with a little scoop of honey or with milk as well. That's why my wife likes it. She likes it with a little bit of honey and a bit of cream. Um, It reminds her of her grandmother and the way her grandmother used to make tea. And it is a style of tea that I've come to actually really love and appreciate. So definitely check it out. You might have to order it on Amazon just simply because I have not been able to find it in stores for quite some time. But again, the Celestial Seasonings Nutcracker Blend, highly recommend it. So in this episode, we're going to really explore how trauma changes the brain. Now, the key is, is that we need to understand specifically how the brain reacts and develops in response to traumatic experiences, both that are ongoing and from the past that prepares us as instructors. It gives us the necessary background for selecting instructional and de-escalation strategies that we can use in the classroom. I became aware that something like this was important because my, the bulk of my experience has been in so-called urban schools. And I have worked with a number of students who have experienced trauma in the past or continue to live with trauma just in their daily lives. And so I've made my fair share of mistakes in making assumptions about my students in the ways that I've interacted with them, more or less essentially escalating them instead of de-escalating them and re-traumatizing them in some instances instead of lessening the burden that their trauma bears. Now, I am a little bit biased, or sorry, forgive me, I don't mean biased, I mean I'm basing this episode off of a training that I received from Mercy Home for Boys and Girls. A number of years ago when I was in the classroom, Mercy Home for Boys and Girls sent out a representative to my school and gave us a training on how to see the signs of trauma and how to work with students who have, again, past traumatic experiences in addition to ongoing traumatic experiences. And in the course of the training, they discussed how the traumatic experiences impacted the growth and development of the student's brain in addition to how does this manifest in the classroom. 
Now, this training was a number of years ago, so I've got a lot of, I've retained a lot of it. However, I had to go back and do a little bit of additional research just to firm up a bit of the terminology and the specifics of the, uh, of the way that the trauma impacts the brain. So in the show notes, I'm going to have a direct link to the website, to the page from the Mercy Home for Boys and Girls website that I pulled the bulk of this information from. So I want you all to be aware of that. And again, I want to point you in that direction as well, because Mercy Home for Boys and Girls is a fantastic organization that really looks out for the best interests of children everywhere. So the first step in working with students with trauma is to begin to shift your mindset from thinking what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. It is very common that if you are unfamiliar with the signs of trauma in a person, your instinct is going to be to ask, well, what's wrong with you? Why are you acting like this? Or why are you doing this or not doing this? It's very easy to have that very like deficit mindset of people. And it is very important to begin to shift your thinking around really understanding what has happened to you, what has caused you to act or think or approach life in this way. Now, this really goes outside of teaching and into just practical daily living, but use this as a frame, essentially, of your interactions with everyone you meet. Simply to say, you don't know what everybody is going through or went through, and you don't know why exactly people may be doing what they're doing. But if you begin to think of it from a perspective of well, what has happened to you to lead you to act or think or process information or, or do things in, in whatever this way means, it begins to help generate some sympathy and empathy with those people. And it also tend, leads to reduce escalations of conflict. Now, forgive me when I say those people, that, that's again, just like a slip of, of the tongue. But I mean to say people with trauma, people who are living with trauma or who have had traumatic experiences. So moving on from the beginning mindset shift from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you, let's dive a little deeper on how it impacts the different parts of the brain. Now, one important, and eh, there's actually a couple really important things to note that's baked into this before we dive into all of like the nitty gritty details, is that your brain is a highly complex organ, and there are aspects of its function that scientists are still discovering. That's to say that we don't know fully the impacts of trauma on the brain. Again, I emphasize that word fully. We do know many of the impacts, but we don't know all of them because we are still discovering and understanding more and more of this organ that dictates our entire life. And so and the following things that I'm going to mention are just trends that we have observed. Um, I, I use that word we very loosely. Um, I mean to say neuroscientists who have studied this matter in depthly and also behavioral scientists and social scientists and, and everybody who has looked at people with traumatic experiences and sought to understand it, what they've noted. Um, another important thing thing to really pay attention to is the fact that I am not a 100% expert in this. I have a number of experiences in it. I have taken trainings in it. However, I am not a neuroscientist. I cannot give you the 100% answer to everything. I can only more or less give you, give you what I've researched and what I've studied as mentioned previously. So please keep that aware. So if I'm fumbling through some of the stuff, some of the words, if I don't say everything that is perfectly 100% correct, um, I'm going to do my best to make sure I note any of that in a future episode or in a future Facebook post or, or something to that extent. Um, but show me grace in that regard. However, this is also a topic that we are going to continue to explore, not just in this short little series that we're doing, but throughout the course in the life of this podcast, simply because trauma is such a an important feature of teaching. Because especially in our current age of COVID, we still don't know the full impact and how it is currently leading to our students being traumatized by it. I mean, honestly, thinking of how at a such a crucial time in our children's lives, they're being told, 
it's not safe to go outside. It's not safe to be around people. It's not safe to be in public. You need to just do your part and mask up, but to the best of your ability, just stay inside all day long and, and avoid human interaction. That's antithetical to what it means to be human. We as humans are social creatures. We crave interactivity, not just through a digital platform, but through person to person contact, through face to face, human to human contact. And so for many of our students, this is very difficult. I have, I have a friend who is an extrovert. And at, when COVID was first starting, he's saying it was very, very difficult for him simply because he thrived and craved human interaction. And it's what brought him energy and it's what brought him life. And it was extremely difficult to adjust to just this new way of doing things. And so for many of our students who have not yet learned to think about themselves on that larger level and understand the connections between what society is telling them to do and how it's leading them to think and act, this is going to be a traumatizing experience for them. And it is our role as educators to help support them through that, to help them better understand it and help support them so that they can learn to grow through this as well. So now I'm going to dive into some of the ways that the brain physiology is is shaped shaped that is not even a word um shaped as a result of trauma and traumatic experiences so the first part of of my research uh uncovered this is that it leads to a smaller prefrontal cortex now this is probably the most common thing that everybody knows about the brain, but the frontal cortex essentially is what contains your personality. And so it's much more specifically as it relates to trauma, it's what controls your behavior. It's what controls your cognition, the way that you understand things and the way that you learn. And then it also controls your emotional regulation. So this is one of those first signs that we see in, in people living with trauma is that they tend to lack some sense of emotional regulation. Again, it is not to say that these are unclimbable mountains. I have seen and I've worked with people who have had traumatic experiences, who have learned how to develop some systems of coping when they are struggling to regulate their emotions, when they're struggling to control impulsive behaviors. It's not impossible, but it is challenging, and it is a challenge that they must fight with and face every single day of their lives. Another area of the brain that is impacted is there's a smaller corpus callosum. I really hope I said that word correctly, but it is the largest white matter structure in the brain. And I had to look this up even further. It's like what the white matter does is it helps your brain communicate within itself. It helps send the signals and the responses to the different synapses that dictate you on how you are supposed to act and interact with people in any sort of situation. And so it re begins to restrict that and makes those kinds of functions a little bit more delayed than they normally would be or should be for people who have not experienced trauma. Additionally, it leads to a smaller hippocampus. Now, this is very critical because the hippocampus is the center of all memory. It is what controls your short and long-term memory. And as we know as educators, having a very good, strong memory is uh, tantamount to being a scholar, is tantamount to being a high-quality student in terms of learning the content that you need to learn in addition to learning and developing the skills that you need to learn. If you are struggling with issues with memory, then that school is just going to be much more difficult for you. It also leads to a smaller cerebellum, which leads to motor behavior issues, uh, but on a much grander scale that I've noted just consistently in my own practice is struggles with executive functioning. And for those of you that may not be aware, in a nutshell, executive functioning is your ability to organize your life more or less. That isn't to say that if you're a disorganized kind of person, you have issues with executive functioning, but this is more or less the same day-to-day -day processes just seem to break down a whole lot easier for you. And sometimes you just don't even know that there's steps that you're missing. So what I've noticed is that students that strug struggle with, with executive functioning tend to need significantly more reminders to perform simple tasks, uh, and, such as taking out a pencil or making sure that they have a pencil with them or making sure that they put their homework in a folder or in a binder 
craft, making sure that they keep up with their homework. I think these are using student based examples. But these are very simple things that I mean, we can say like, oh, every single student suffers from executive functioning issues because they can't do this. But most of those students that are very disorganized are very disorganized because they haven't gotten in the practice of really organizing their life. Students that struggle with executive functioning, it's not because they haven't gotten into the practice of it. It's because their brain hasn't necessarily developed in that way. Again, this isn't to say that this is an impossible hill to climb. I've seen students that have struggled with executive functioning and they've been able to build those systems and routines in their life that the routines more or less help supplement that. Um, the last piece that they that scientists have really noted is that there's an overactive amygdala. Now, the amygdala is in control of your fight, flight, or freeze responses. Now, we, we typically say fight or flight, but there is that third one of freeze where sometimes in very difficult, intense situations where it's that gut reaction, some people just freeze up and stop moving and they more or less just stop thinking. And students that have had traumatic experiences in the past more or less operate in that frame where it is either every single response, every single stimuli that they're receiving, they more they simply go with that gut reaction of, am I going to fight? Am I going to come out really aggressive and strong? Am I going to run away or am I going to freeze up? And this is sometimes the most obvious sign where very innocuous things in class can set a kid off and they'll go off on you and threaten to fight you and threaten to or fight another kid or or whatever. And they get really, really aggressive. And you're standing in the background. You're like, what did I say? What did I do? And again, with dealing and working with students with trauma, That sometimes is their response. Additionally, one thing that I've seen a lot is flight. Students retreat. They either try to physically retreat and run away from the situation, or they mentally and emotionally retreat and and go into themselves, and they seclude themselves, and they try to hide away from the circumstance because they don't know how to deal with it in that context. And the last part is just freeze, and, and as the word obviously implies, they freeze up. They they don't really interact and they don't are they aren't very clear in what they're trying to do or their end goal because their brain is just sending a signal saying like I don't know what to do I don't know how to act I don't know and so uh, that is the response that we tend to see now again I'm going to put this disclaimer at the end I am not a 100% expert I'm delivering information that I have been taught before but these are the common trends that we see in the development of the brain Now, what we're going to discuss further in next week's episode is what does this look like in the classroom? I already talked about some examples of what this looks like in the classroom. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper in some other examples that I've called from the research. And we're going to we're going to think a little bit more reflectively on how do we as instructors work to overcome those barriers that are then built up as a result. So think about this. When you know a student has experienced trauma in their life or are continuing to experience trauma in their life, you need to know and really recognize that a person's brain is not finished developing until they're the age of 25. And so the student that you see before you, be they a teenager, be they a first grader, Their brain is still growing and developing. Their brain is still moldable. And you play that important part in their life of helping them grow and develop. Again, trauma and traumatic experiences are horrible things. All right, they are awful. I I wouldn't wish anybody that I know or even enemies that I know to experience trauma because it is horrible because it haunts you like a specter. And it's hard to escape it because sometimes you don't even know that you are dealing with it. And it takes time and and sometimes it takes therapy to help you uncover those layers, to help you really realize that some of these experiences you had growing up have greatly impacted you and greatly impacted you for the worse. And so our duty as teachers is to be really responsive to that and to know that 
there are things our students have dealt with and are dealing with that we just don't know. And we need to be sensitive to that. And we need to know that we are playing a role in their brain developing positive responses to the things that they're seeing. We are playing a role in helping their brain grow to the point that it needs to be. Again, they they experiencing all of these negative stimuli that's hampering the growth of their brain. And so it becomes our responsibility and our duty to present that positive stimuli to help their brains cope, to help their brains grow into ways to manage the pain that they have experienced. This is no small task. In fact, it is a very overwhelming task because we're not really just talking about one student and we're talking about the hundred students, 150 students that we teach, that we interact with every single year. And so we need to be very, very aware of the weight of responsibility that we have before us because we're playing a very active role in shaping and developing this future generation and shaping and developing their brains. Honestly, we are, think of it like this. We are coaches for bodybuilders, but the, we're not building their, their, their biceps or their triceps or their quads or, or anything like that. We're building their brain. We're building the the most important piece of their body because it dictates everything that they do. And so we want to play a role in helping them continue that positive growth and positive development because just as we play this positive role, very unintentionally and regrettably, sometimes intentionally, we play a negative role and we hurt our students. So we need to take this knowledge that we have and we need to remember very, very clearly to be asking the question, what has happened to you? And to even go one step further and ask ourselves, what can I do to help? What can I do to relieve your stress, to relieve your pain, to relieve your trauma? Because truth be told, the student is going to have to essentially deal with that their entire life. They're going to have to work through that their entire life. What can we do to make the burden a little bit lighter? And that becomes your homework for today, for this week, is I want you to think, what can you do to even for just a quick little moment, relieve a student's burden and really help them manage this beast that they have to fight on a daily basis, whether they know it or not. So I'm going to close with that. So be sure to follow and like us on Facebook at Morning Prep Pod. If you have questions, If you really liked what we were talking about and you want to know more, shoot me an email. I will do my best. I will research as much as I can to try to get you as many answers as I can. Um, And if you honestly have further questions, I I want to hear them because this is going to help fuel my own research so that because if one person is asking it and thinking it, that means multiple people are asking it and thinking it. I honestly have a special guest coming up, not next week, but the week after, that's going to talk about this topic a little bit more at length. And I'm really excited for this guest. Um, I'm really excited for you to meet her because she is phenomenal at what she does because she knows students really well. And she knows students that have experienced trauma really, really well. And so I'm looking forward to hearing what hearing ah, I'm looking forward for you to hear what she has to say. So if you have episodes to suggest as well, please send an email to morningpreppod at gmail.com. This was the Morning Prep Podcast. The bell is about to ring. I will see you in the classroom.